State Library of Queensland, and Leah Giles Peters, the State Librarian. Thank you for your fantastic support and thank you for attending today. SLQ has given us fantastic support as major partner, along as Arts Queensland. We've also been generous, generously supported by, as, by our major creative partner, Creative Enterprise Australia from QUT, our major innovation partner, University of Queensland, and our media partner, Map Magazine. There are many other supporters and sponsors which we'll thank later. Our ambition was to have a TEDx Brisbane experience that was close as possible to a live TED event. I've been very privileged to go to three TED events, and I can tell you that the buzz in this room is just the same as it is in Long Beach, so fantastic. The essence of TED is to have the conversation outside the room as well as what happens on the stage. So please, when you're out in the tent or in the corridors, introduce yourself to new people and spread ideas. I'd like to start to thank the staff of TEDx and TED who have given us great support in putting this event on, as well as the members of the TEDx community and TED globally watching on Ustream. Great to have you with us. Some housekeeping. Please wear your name tag at all times. Uh, it gets you in and out of the building uh, with your bag, and it's for your pre-morning tea, lunch, and post-event drink. Uh, as you know, each session you rotate. You guys got, got that all worked out, so I don't need to explain that to you. If you have any questions throughout the day, ask anyone with a black uh, T-shirt, except for Carl and I. Um, as you've been advised, these lectures will be recorded uh, and videoed, so if you have a problem with that, let the SLQ staff know. Um, if you need to leave during the, uh, uh, the session, which I'm sure you won't, but if you do for some reason, please use the rear door at the back. Uh, the bathrooms are located on level two outside here and also on level three. Uh, morning tea, lunch, and post TED X drinks will be in the Maywa uh, tent um, green, the Ideas Worth Spreading tent, which has been kindly donated by um, Arts Queensland. When you're using the tent, you can use the bathrooms down on the Knowledge Walk on level one. Um, no food inside the, the library. Um, there's special and rare collections here, so it's very important that you um, uh, adhere to this rule, uh, and you can only bring in bottled water. Um, please be on time for each session. Um, we've got a pretty power-packed day, which has just got uh, even more power-packed given the, um, uh, that we've lost um, 20 minutes or so. So, to kick things off, um, what I'd like to do is introduce you to a, um, a video by Chris Anderson, the curator of TED. Thank you. Welcome to this special program called TEDx. We'll come to the X bit in a minute. But what is TED? Well, it started out as an annual conference that brought together leaders from the technology, entertainment, and design industries. That's the T, E, and D of TED. But over the years, the content has become a lot broader. And now we welcome great thinkers and doers, creators and visionaries from all areas of thought and work and life. Because what we've realized is that all knowledge is connected and that you can get unexpected insight and inspiration when you listen to people who are outside your normal line of work. A few years ago, we started making TED Talks freely available over the internet. And to our astonishment, we saw them starting to spread virally to an audience of literally millions all over the world. It turns out that in every country, there are curious souls just like you who are excited by the power of ideas. They want to learn, and they want to grow, and they want to find a future they can believe in. So we ended up redefining our mission at TED to be simply ideas worth spreading. Now, many people experience TED Talks alone, sitting at their computer or perhaps watching them on their cell phone. But we think it's sometimes better to watch TED in a group. And that's why we launched this TEDx program. So the X stands for Independently Organized TED Event. We here at TED actually played no role at all in organizing your event today, uh, other than making our talks freely available. 
And that's the joy of the program. It allows organizers who are passionate about TED to share it with their friends and colleagues and family and to put together a program of their own choosing. Now, these events aren't supposed to be used to make money or to push any specific commercial or religious or political agenda. Uh, they're just about curiosity and the exploration of ideas and the pursuit of knowledge. So in a moment, you'll be watching a selection of talks put together by your organizer, and uh, perhaps afterwards, you will be able to engage in a creative conversation about them and what to do with them. We'd love to get uh, your response to your experience today. Um, so if you feel so inclined, do please write to us. And um, after you've experienced TED, we, we hope you'll take the time to engage in a conversation with the people around you about creative responses to what you've heard, and perhaps come visit us at TED.com, see some more talks, and uh, join in an even broader conversation with other members of the global TED community. So I would like to thank your local organizer for taking TED and sharing it with you. And now, on with the show. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, I'm your organizer with Carl. I'd like to introduce Carl Lindgren, uh, owner, editor of Map Magazine, who's going to uh, host the first session and get it underway. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll be brief and we'll get started. But thank you for coming out today. It's uh, our first TEDx Brisbane event and we're incredibly excited. Paul and I met uh, over two years ago for a coffee and uh, idea, and obviously it's an idea worth spreading. Uh, we're very proud to be putting on TEDx Brisbane today. It's great to be sharing such a diverse group of local speakers, and I look forward to and hope you enjoy a day of inspiring conversation. So the day kickstarts with uh, session one, all you need is to see, and first up is Kevin Finn. Kevin's an Irishman. He's an internationally recognized graphic designer. The prestigious American design magazine, Step, selected Kevin Finn as one of 25 best emerging designers. He is principal of his independent design practice, Finn Creative. And prior to this, Kevin held the joint position of creative director at Satsi Design in Sydney for seven years. Please welcome to the stage, the TEDx Brisbane stage, the first speaker today, Designer extraordinaire, Kevin Finn. That's a bit scary. First speaker of the day, first speaker of TEDx Brisbane. But it's exciting, really exciting. I mean, I think I'm, I'm really, really sort of um, energized by the potential of today. I think that, um, whoa, that's not supposed to happen. I'm energized by the fact that you've had a preview. <laughs> um, this, this will happen. Um, but no, I'm really excited about um, all the stuff that, that uh, today is going to offer. Um, and what I'd like to talk about is um, challenging conventions, um, stepping outside your comfort zone. I'm, I'm Chris said earlier in, in that um, recording that um, you know curious people, curious minds. I'm absolutely curious about so many things. I'm interested in everything, which is really exciting and exhausting. But I, I think that something like TED and groups like this are great venues and great formats to share those ideas. Um, for me, that idea of being curious and questioning things has led me to do some um, rather unorthodox things for my field. Um, which I'll talk to you about in a few minutes. Um, but I want to, do, do you guys know Michael Lunick, the Australian cartoonist? Yes. Brilliant, isn't he? Fantastic. Um, I remember seeing this in one of his books uh, years back, and uh, it's a book about um, his conversations with God. Um, and this says, God gives us strength, strength to hold on and strength to let go. 
I think for me, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, that, that's, that really sums up where many people can find themselves, that they're hanging on to something and they're afraid to make a decision, afraid to let go because what's going to happen if I do something, uh, afraid to stay because what's going to happen if I stay, what am I going to miss out? And I think that that, that can be a sort of a paralysis of, of um, not, not allowing you to make a decision. And I think for me, it's really about just make a decision and see what happens. You, you will never really know what could possibly happen. Um, we try and predict what might happen to us, and I think that that can, can be the, the sort of force behind this paralysis. No disrespect to Mystic Medusa, we can't predict what's going to happen. Um, things change, um, we do something, we make a decision, it leads us to an, uh, down another path, and um, and that's kind of what, what I get excited about, that unpredictability about where you can go. In my case, um, as Carl was saying, I used to live in, uh, in Sydney, and m my wife and I were driving down Elizabeth Street in Sydney, and she said to me, um, what would you do, what would you say if I applied for a job in Kununurra? I was like, great. What's Kununurra? Oh, well, Kununurra. <laughs> it is 3,212 kilometers north of Perth. Um, it's not very close to Sydney. <laughs> In fact, actually, um, if you want to go from Sydney to Kununurra, generally speaking, you're going to be Sydney, Perth, Broome, Kununurra. That will take you in airplanes and airports, 10 hours. You could be in Asia quicker. You haven't left the country. Um, so, I, I lived in, in, in Sydney, I was thinking, all right, actually the other thing is Sydney, right? Population of what, five to six million. Kananara, population of about five to six thousand. It's a suburb in comparison. Um, also, the The closest city, really, uh, is Darwin, which is somewhere there. <laughs> um, and that's probably the closest biggest hub, and it's a one-hour flight away. Uh, the, the other direction is Broome, and that's a one-hour flight the other way. So we're pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Now, you might think, because when I lived in Sydney, and uh, I was, uh, you know, worked at Saatchi, that was our view of, of, from the office. Oh, you know. uh, so you, you, know, you wouldn't be surprised when people came to me and said, Leaving Saatchi, you're going to Kununurra. You know. In Saatchi, uh, we had a staff of about six in the design team. Uh, we, that was connected to the agency, which had about 160 people. The agency is part of a network of about 10,000 people. And uh, I was going to Kununurra on my own if I took this decision. But, so why would I go to Kununurra? Well, Kununurra is absolutely beautiful. Um, you can't really see there, but uh, it's got lots of greenery, which is water, beautiful red with these amazing big um, electrical storms and wet seasons, it's, it's phenomenal. Now, I talked earlier about, you know, outside comfort zones. I'm Irish. I'm hardly equipped to live somewhere like this, <laughs> really. Um, in this water, we have some beautiful little animals. Um, in certain areas, there are freshwater crocodiles, three meters. In other areas, there are saltwater crocodiles, five, 5.7 meters. This little lady is about five meters. Um, it's so remote that Indiana Jones can't make it. Um, <laughs> it's pretty, pretty remote. Um, so really, you know, when you when you look at it like that, why would you leave Sydney and Saatchi and go somewhere like this? Well, my beautiful wife decided that this job she wanted to take was there. So really, I guess. Or needed love, that's what we'll say today. Now, there are lots of things that sort of happened to me when I went to Kununurra. Um, as a graphic designer, I thought, right, well, there's no graphic design studios there. Um, I don't have any studio to join. I've got to set my own company up. Um, I've got no experience in that. I've got no clue, really. I don't have any clients. Um, I've pretty gone blind. So it's like that Michael Looney thing. You've got to let go and, and, and do it. Um, so 
one of the things that, that was, was great, because the population in Kananara, about 60%, I think, is uh, Aboriginal, 60%. And I was working a lot with Indigenous organizations. And I have a, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in Aboriginal cultures, but I have this view as a graphic designer that how we portray Aboriginal culture is very one-dimensional, very um, one-eyed, and usually it's painting and dot painting. And, and I think that it really doesn't fulfill the, the length and breadth of what Aboriginal culture is. And I think we've pigeonholed it into this dot painting kind of visual perception. So when I was sort of deciding on what kind of work I was going to do, I thought, I want to challenge this. I want to challenge how we work with Aboriginal culture and how we portray it and, and depict it. So um, my first project was with a, an Aboriginal trust called Ab um, Gilgangan Trust. And, um, I went to the presentation, it was to do a, a brochure in Palapo, and it was about the land agreement between the traditional owners and the diamond mine. And I was at this presentation, and I thought, right, I'm going to do it. I've got nine Aboriginal trustees looking at me. I've got two who, who don't know me, two independent trustees who don't know me, a bunch of mining executives who work with my wife, but they don't really know me. And I'm saying, guys, what we do to portray Aboriginal culture is wrong. You know, we're just painting. My God, dot painting. Why are we doing this? There are other ways. I had eight Aboriginal trustees staring blankly at me. I had mining execs dropping their heads. And I had one Aboriginal trustee nodding her head. Yes, yes. I was saying, painting is important, but it's not everything. There's, there are other ways we can do this. She was nodding her head. I found out later she was the only painter on the panel. And she understood that painting is important. Dot painting is only one area of, of uh, Aboriginal painting and only one geographic location. So I kind of thought, well, there is they, they've given me a leeway to explore this. And I've stepped out of my own comfort zone. I've challenged the conventions in my work when, when I can. And with this particular piece of work, because it was about the agreement between Aboriginal uh, traditional owners and the mining company, I was Algonquin mine, I thought, it's about the land. Let's just use the land. So. A very, very simple idea is a pile of red dirt. So what? If you look at Aboriginal culture, that is country. That is home. That is part of their culture. That is where they belong. It has immense cultural value. You look at a mining company, that's what they, th that's what they look for their resources. That's the value. So what I was hoping to do and what I've been trying to do is speak to both um, non-Indigenous and Indigenous in a way that respects both parties equally. Um, also with this, a very simple idea, you start off with a pile of red dirt uh, or, or red earth, but that can then be used to make other, uh, it's a visual language, you can use other things to explain certain things uh, about the agreement, and all of a sudden you have this visual language that is still relevant to Aboriginal culture and the mining company, but is not dot painting. Um, the other thing about challenging conventions, I really enjoy working with people who challenge conventions. Uh, in terms of um, Aboriginal culture, there's uh, an amazing writer called uh, Alexis Wright, award-winning writer who wrote a book called Grog War, which challenges uh, the whole alcohol addiction um, within Aboriginal communities. So I work with Magabala Books, and they asked me to redesign this, this book cover. And living in Kananara, I sell lots of discarded cans and, and things, and um, Cans, and I thought, what a really good way to, to express what she told me about is to say, this is what it is about. It's about discarded beer cans around. This is what's devastating Aboriginal culture. But it's also the energy that we, we use to fight it, to crush it. Um, so I've been really lucky to, to try and redefine how we can project Aboriginal culture with more relevant symbolism and in a more contemporary way uh, in, in, with equal respect. So I think all you need to do is really take a, a chance in a different direction and challenging conventions and stepping outside your comfort zone. Now, very, very quickly, interesting story in Kananara. Well, actually, my wife thinks I look like Jodie Wenham. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so um, she reckons it looks like David Wenham. And, and um, there's a, um, a little film you might have heard of from Baz Luhrmann called Australia, which is fi filmed in Kananara, actually, some of it. And my wife said, hey, go and do casting. We should pretend that David Wenham did a cameo. Uh, 
So I went, yeah, funny. Okay, I'll, I'll go and give it a shot. And uh, so I'll go. And uh, as it turns out, he is in it. And as it turns out, I end up being his stand-in for a couple of things. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm, on I'm on set with Baz Luhrmann, Nicole Kidman, David Wynn. I'm going, whoa, I'm in Kununara. What are the... What are the chances? You make a decision, you never know where it's going to lead. More interesting, I was also at the time commissioned by the uh, uh, Irish National Postal Service to design a set of stamps. What was the theme? Filmed in Ireland. I'm on a set, a Hollywood style set, in Kununara, researching a project that I'm working for in Ireland. And the set of stamps, uh, again, using uh, challenging conventions, this is a format for a stamp that's not very often used, but it was really good for getting my idea across of having a, a film strip flipping. And uh, the four stamps that I stick, and then you put them together, you've got stamps. So really, I think all you need is a famous doppelganger and <laughs> a series of... <laughs> it happens! It happens. So, I'm going to go back to this. There was a time when I graduated from, from design school where I had this idea, hey, you know, I, I might do a publication, but I'm not a journalist, I'm not an editor, I'm not a uh, publisher, what do I know? I spent eight years hanging on that piece of rope going, should I, shouldn't I, what will I do, maybe? And then one day I said, well, just give it a shot, see what happens. And the publication is called Open Manifesto, uh, and what it tries to do, a little bit like Tate, it tries to look at how things are connected, um, how graphic design relates to society, culture, politics, economics, and how it affects graphic design. Uh, this issue, I talked to two graduates. One was an Aboriginal design graduate, one was a Muslim graduate. And I was looking at things that we don't normally hear in, in the graphic design field. Um, issue two, I didn't think I'd get past issue one. Issue two, would you believe Edward de Bono wrote for me? Do you know Edward de Bono? Uh, Edward de Bono. I had a phone call from Edward de Bono. Issue two, I interviewed Stefan Tagmeister, who's a gentleman, you know, just amazing. Um, this issue, issue three, this is about, um, well, what is graphic design? I had the privilege of talking to a, um, uh, an Israeli graphic designer who lost his child to the Palestinian bombing, and at the time was saying, we need to set aside divisions, and he's now in the parents' circle, which are trying to get Palestinian and Israeli people together to fight this terrible situation. Uh, he doesn't hate anyone, he just says, this happened, we need to fight it. Uh, this is the sort of thing that interests me in the field I, I'm in, and I'm questioning what I do as a profession. So I do this publication to ask people, find out, share experiences. Um, this issue, propaganda, issue four, I interviewed Noam Chomsky. Jeez, you know. Uh, I interviewed Academy Award winning er Errol Morris. Um, it's just crazy. Uh, in fact, you know, um, when someone like me is preparing to do an interview with Noam Chomsky or take a phone call from Edward de Bono, it's a pretty good laxative. It's really, <laughs> it's, it's good. This issue is about identity. Um, and I, I, I spoke to an ex-CIA um, um, operative. I spoke to a real-life superhero in Florida called Master Legends. Uh, I spoke to some people who did an, uh, an article about North Korean people moving to South, refugees moving to South Korea, and how they're working with their identity um, between North and South. It, it, it's a fascinating way for me to learn what I can that's related to my field. Um, but it scares the hell out of me. Um, and that's what I think is, you know, it's like the omnibus edition. You just start and I'm telling you all the things you need. You need this, you need this, but really, this, this sort of sums up what, what pushes me in, in Open Manifesto. Now, we talked, about, um, we talked about identity and that. As a graphic designer, there's also an opportunity to, to use what I've learned through this, to use how I've learned things living in Kununara and moving into different areas. Uh, we lived in Kununara for three years, so I had a really good understanding of, of living in certain circumstances. Um, but I, I constantly watch the news. I'm, I'm reading wherever I can, I, I, and, and it's given me a voice. Um, I was asked once to do a poster for a competition, um, and um, I told, uh, it was around 2006, with the President Bush um, foreign policy and the Prime Minister Howard's foreign policy is quite similar, and I thought, well, I need to make a comment on that. And um, 
I thought, this is a call of quite different. Really, at the time, 2006, this summed up for me what was going on between Australian culture and, and American culture. There was just a slight difference because of policy and, and, and everything. I went and, and, and saw this exhibited in Melbourne, and there was a man standing next to it looking at it, and he didn't know I designed it, and he just said very quietly, oh, that's scary. <laughs> now, if we look at it now, and we said, hang on, we've got this, and we've got President Obama, uh, we, we want to be that. Be, yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. So it's interesting how our, our sort of minds shift between how situations change. And for me, it, it interests me to do work that is sort of timeless or can have more meaning beyond the point it was made. Um, again, with this whole idea of, of identity and, and cultural identity, which is something that goes through um, Open Manifesto as well, I've been able to be probably more aware than I've had in the past about Australian cultural identity and national identity. So there's an amazing project in, um, in Adelaide from three very young, talented designers called the Australia Project. And they're looking at Australian national identity and, and, and sort of cultural identity. And they invited me to do some work for that. And I thought, great, yeah, that's great. I've been doing this for ages. But when it came down to it, I thought, mm, yeah, how do you sum up what's going to happen or what is happening with, with national and cultural identity? And um, I started looking at, well, if you look at Australia, we're sort of a Caucasian multicultural country. It's very much uh, about Caucasians, whites. Um, and I think that although we're trying to get this multicultural sort of side out, we're still putting out Australia predominantly in the mainstream as a white population. Plus, if you look at the rela racial relationships that were going on, rela racial relations, you've got the Indian um, situation, you've got Kamala riots, you've got Aboriginal issues. And I think that uh, a way to sum it up is um, it's just work in progress, really. Uh, we can look at that negatively, we can look at that positively. But I think that we have a lot of work to do uh, as, as a nation to really get beyond this idea that it is a white country trying to be multicultural. It's multicultural, full stop. Plus, when we look at Aboriginal um, culture, I think that um, that might sound sort of down and, and depressing and negative, but the future for Aboriginal people has to do with their ancestors, has to do with their past. It has to do with their future and their present. The future of Australia is is also about Aboriginal culture. We have to really embrace it properly. Um, and when you look at all that kind of stuff I've been talking about, for me, it's really about how, how you see those connections. Now, I've spoke to, I've met Nigel Brennan yesterday for the very first time. He was speaking last this evening. And we were like, oh, you know, chat, 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 chat. I was from Karanara. Really? Oh, I used to, I went there once. Do you know Gerald Cole? Yes, he's a friend of mine. These connections, I meet somebody for the first time yesterday, he knows someone I know in Kananara. We're all connected, things are connected. For me, it's all about learning, which TED is about. I'm passionate about learning, I'm passionate about challenging conventions, I'm passionate about um, getting outside my comfort zone and sharing that with people. And there's one reason for it, it's my philosophy. Thanks, Kevin. I understand your point about the good laxative um, before an interview, but also I would like your uh, autograph just in case, in case I can use it. Um, good news, Auditorium 2 is up and running. Uh, kicked in about five minutes into the session, so welcome, Auditorium 2. <laughs> Wherever you are, <laughs> please welcome your guests. Part of TED, we've got as part of the TED sessions is uh, some brain bursts, some three minute talks. Uh, it's not listed in the main program, but it is listed as a short minute, three minute talk. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Shwenny Chu. Shwenny graduated from UQ with a major in economics. He's the co founder of and is currently working on Pressio, a website that aims to discover the value of content on the internet through the means of complexity economics. Please welcome to the TEDx Brisbane stage to discuss emergence theory, 20. Uh, 
up. Let's start the recording. Okay, so what do, you, what do you see big and common with these things? What do these things, the ant hill, the economy, a traffic jam, and a human brain have in common? And since I'm only on a three minute talk, I'm going to tell you that uh, <laughs> these things are all emergence phenomena. So, emergence means that, you know, a pattern or a design that comes out from a system with individual agents, individual units. More often than not, these individual units would be working for their own benefits. The ant is working for its own benefit. The um, trader, everybody knows that, hey. <laughs> so, as I, as, as I previously mentioned, a uh, traffic jam is a system with emergent properties. And it is also a uh, self-organizing uh, system in the sense that there is, no, there is no dictator that says, okay, this car goes here, that car goes there. No. What happens with the traffic jam is everybody, every driver is interested in, you know, getting to their own appointment. So they rush and they get into the traffic jam. This picture was uh, taken in Delhi, India. And um, in Delhi, India, they, had very, they have a very interesting way of solving traffic jam problems. And it's by using the same process that gets them into the jam in the first place. <laughs> you see, in, in Delhi, they do not respect the traffic laws as much as we do here. And it, Frankly, it's not less enforced as it is here. So when they get into a traffic jam, you start seeing people acting on their own. And, and you know, you see people doing UEs in the middle of the road. That's going forward. And as strange as it sounds, that's how smooth flowing traffic emerges in, in, in Delhi. And I think this is very important in the sense that it illustrates the um, butterfly effect. So there is no need to explain what the butterfly effect is. Yeah, uh, everyone knows, but just to recap. A butterfly effect is when you have small, tiny changes in the system that causes large overall changes within the system. So, yeah. And the economy. The economy is affected by the butterfly effect. When I was in uni, my lecturer used to tell us a story about how coffee prices in Brazil would affect um, aluminum prices in another country. And if you've read Tim Harper, this wouldn't be new to you. But you see, while this story was meant to you know, illustrate the uh, powers of the perfect market in conveying information, uh, view it from another point of view and you see the butterfly effect in action. Now, everybody in this room, everybody's listening to this lecture is uh, part of the economy. We're all actors in the economy and together we are the economy. Every little change we make will affect the economy. It may be big, it may be small. So, where does this leave us? Well. You know, there's been debates about, you know, whether uh, the bailouts have been a good thing or not. I'm going to say, let it be. I'm going to, you know, mirror what Kevin said and make a decision, stick with it, and see what happens. See? <coughs> the economy as a complex system has just begun to be studied. It's, 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 you know, it's forces of evolution and, and complexity. So it's just begun to be studied by uh, the uh, Santa Fe Institute and schools like UQ and the Art Center for system and it would be very arrogant for us to say that we know that it's going to be good or bad. So for now let the Beatles say with the words of wisdom and let it be. I actually met Twenty over the holiday break uh, between Christmas and New Year and I could have spent three days talking to him about all his ideas. Incredible brain there. Our next talk is by Leonard, Flo, and Philip. Can simple biological systems be built from standard, interchangeable parts and operated in living cells? Or is biology just too complicated to be engineered in this way? Please welcome to the TEDx Brisbane stage, Leonard, Flo, and Phil to discuss DIY genetics.
And we're going to talk about the advantages of this competition, the differences of it to synthetic biology, and the sorts of experiences that the kids get, and how this can change our future and our world. And um, I guess all you really need in, in that regard is curiosity, and that's a, a very TED sort of thing. So first of all, what is synthetic biology? Um, the actual term synthetic biology came to us around about uh, the year 1900 by um, Stefan Leduc. Uh, he was very visionary in that he tried to deconstruct cells, take the very principal elements of a cell, and then put it back together again and make the cell. Back then, we had no idea about the genetic information. We, we didn't know that DNA was encoding for the genes which made the proteins and made the different components of our cells. So uh, Stefan was uh, a miserable failure with, with these experiments, but very visionary. He, the technology wasn't there to support his ideas. Uh, if we move along our timeline, in 1953, Watson and Crick solved the CRISPR structure of DNA, the double helix, and we now understand that our genome encodes this pieces of information, which is passed on to generation to generation and produces all these different things in our cell. The next important thing for synthetic biology was in 1978, when we were now able to take genes from one organism and transport them and put them into another organism and take a protein which is specific for one thing and put it into something else and make that protein in something else. Now we move to 2005, and these two people, Tom Knight and Randy Rettberg, they're the fathers of iGEM, but um, they were doing synthetic biology back then, and they've kind of changed a lot of the terms which we have, so we're going to have a bit of a dichotomy of terms as we talk between what is synthetic biology and what is, what is iGEM. And these guys were really the fathers of iGEM, and basically Randy, if, if you don't know who he is, he was one of the fathers of the internet, and when Randy retired, looking around for something to do, so he went and spent some time with Tom, and they started putting together iGEM and doing a lot of these experiments in synthetic biology. So I'm saying a lot about synthetic biology. What is synthetic biology? Basically, if we look at a cell, it's very, very complex. We've got all these things sort of going on at once. We've got all these competing reactions, and it's very, very hard to understand what's going on. If we take something that we're interested in from the cell, and we make a genetic circuit of it with just, just that component of it, and then we find another cell which is a bit more simple and put that genetic circuit into it, we can study that thing that we're interested in in isolation without the complexity of the rest of the cell. And so synthetic biology is a deconstruction and uh, a building up of that, that thing that we're interested in studying to try and understand it in a, in a simplified manner. Uh, something that I want to say now is about tinkering. Um, and it's been, it's been a theme before in, in TED conferences, um, tinkering and our need to tinker. And something that we've, we've lost a lot in the world, and especially in science, is our tinkering. Uh, in the book, uh, The Golem, which is, which is really about uh, what we should know about science, there's an interesting little section talking about uh, the Journal of Biological Psychology. Now, in 1967, the Journal of Biological um, Psychology used to be published in two parts. There was the front section, which contained these fantastic papers by um, neurophysiologists and neurobiologists who were studying all these different things in relation to behavior and biology using these very small worms, which is like a single notochord, like a single neuron. So trying to understand the complexity of the human brain in this very, very simple model, which was this, this worm that they could shine light and they could train to do certain things, they could put different stimulants into the solution to make them swim away from it and things like that. And the back of this journal had this really, really interesting thing which was called the Worm Runner's Digest. And the Worm Runner's Digest was a how-to manual in raising and looking after these worms and um, how you can keep them and, and, and look after them. Now, this, this was primarily published in the UK and there was a lot of little kids around uh, primary school age go out and catch these worms in these creeks and they'd be reading the, the Worm Runner's Digest. How do I raise these things? How do I look after them? You know, what do I do with these things? But then inevitably, they'd turn the book around and they'd start reading these papers from these world famous scientists and the experiments that they were doing with the worms. And it wasn't long before this, this you know, high 
high school and primary school kids started doing the experiments that these professors in, in world-renowned scientists were doing with these worms. And then a really, really interesting thing happened. They started changing the experiments and finding new results and then pushing the field further and writing to these professors and saying, this is how I've changed your experiment. This is what I've found. This is how it differs from your findings. And this is what more I believe it shows is about neurobiology. These are things which we've lost somewhat from um, science. But this is something very much that we feel that, that iGen brings back. So you've heard a little bit about what iGEM is. It really is asking a fundamental question. Can biological systems be built from simple interchangeable parts or, and operated essentially, to create useful and interesting products? Or is it simply too complex? Is it an evolutionary process that simply goes beyond what we can think of and imagine and construct as humans in an engineering kind of mentality? The idea really involves taking the problem as Lenny has described and constructing it. And a good way to think about it is uh, in the original construction and development of the automobile, in the Benz family, an individual would sit down and work on the creation and the fabrication of a car. He would build a tire and a wheel one day. He'd get tired with that. He'd go off and do part of the chassis, get tired with that, go off and work on the engine. Over the period of about a year, an individual car would be created manufacturing industrialization process simplified this and broke the steps of that activity into individual discrete parts, allowing someone who didn't have necessarily the skill for the entire job to nevertheless make a strong contribution to the parts of the job and result in the fabrication of this equally complex end product and much faster. And in fact, that process of decoupling the problem into smaller steps, abstracting it so that you can work on each of those levels separately and then standardizing a mechanism by which you do each of them is what led to that, and which led to the issue, the problem, the statement about iGEM. I'm going to talk now about the students at this point. Hey, everyone. Um, I am a student, um, and I represented the UQ iGEM team in 2009 for the Jamboree. So I'm going to go through a couple of the projects that were a big hit in that Jamboree. So the first project is by Imperial College, and it's called the Encapsulator. So this project tackled a really big question. So some people are born with um, genetic diseases. Some of these diseases uh, don't allow you to produce special molecules that are essential for your body, and thus you might die prematurely. Um, what uh, the Encapsulator tried to do is to get these molecules, put them in bacteria, and get the bacteria to clone itself as a protective agent so you can take it orally, right? Because your stomach has a really, really acidic pH and will degrade everything. So by this capsule, you can protect the molecule inside the bacteria. In addition, you want to make this bacteria safe to consume. So what they did is they chopped up the genome, so the genome, the, the, the DNA, in order to avoid this replication. And thus, you can get a bacterial pill to um, ingest sort of all these molecules that you want in. project is the Cambridge one. So in the Cambridge, they got all these little biotypes that Len was talking about, and they transformed these bacteria, and they changed the color. So you can actually see from red to that pink color over there, and it's the same bacteria, it's just different color. So what the Cambridge team tried to do is use them as biosensors. For example, if there was a lake that was contaminated with mercury, you would sort of connect the mercury sensor and a color, for example, red, connect them together, get a water sample, and put the bacteria in the water sample. If the bacteria and turn red, the water sample would turn red, you would know that there is mercury in the water, and that is really useful for detecting um, toxic waste in water or in the soil. Um, the last project that was really, really interesting is from Pavia from Italy, and they tried to make biofuels out of cheese. So when you make cheese, So it's that sort of liquid solution. And it, uh, it consists of lots of lactose. Lactose is a sugar from milk. 
So what they what the bacteria is doing is to turn that lactose into ethanol. And as we all know, ethanol is used in the barbecue. So technically they're getting bacteria to make this stuff better. So now I'm going to talk about the Australian team, um, the UQ, and the RMIT Smart Technologies. So the UQ team had two projects, basically. The first project was creating a bacterial uh, vacuum or mover um, that will absorb lots of mercury. So like the, the mercury example I gave previously, we would get a water sample that was contaminated with mercury. We would put the bacteria in this water sample, and it will absorb all the mercury. So we can purify water that way. The other project, and this is going to be a bit more ambitious, is we wanted to make it rain. Now I promise this rain is not caused by our bacteria. Okay? <laughs> so uh, we just wanted to tackle the problem of drought um, and improve the agriculture in Australia. So basically we got a bacteria that was uh, blown up into the atmosphere and aggregated a whole bunch of molecules of water, and thus uh, the, the gravity is able to take its place, and thus causing artificial rain. So that was our two projects. And then the RMIT team did aim to make sort of a biological light that wouldn't need any source of energy, no electricity. So that's reducing the carbon emissions and thus tackling the really big problem of global warming. Now, um, I just want to show you a couple videos of a uh, couple of my friends who were in the ISO team, and they're just they're going to explain why they joined the ISO team. It's Michael. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, I joined ITEM because I wanted a unique research experience in my second year, as well as travel overseas. So that's Michael. And then we got Tom. Hi, I'm Tom. I joined IGEM because I wanted to meet people from all over the world and get recognized for our project on an international scale. So, you heard a lot about what uh, the various parts of this thing are. What's really unique about IGEM? The key thing about IGEM is to think about these building blocks, these little bricks. In this case, think about Legos. Legos you can buy in lots of different shapes. By looking at them, you understand the properties and how they fit together. By fitting them together in different shapes and, and forms, you can make cars, you can make buildings, you can make airplanes, you can make all kinds of things because you know exactly how the parts fit together and you know how to assemble them to make something that you're creating. The iGEM team and the iGEM project is in effect making Legos. It's called the Registry of Standard Biological Parts. In, a f in general, the projects these, the students and the teams are making are trying to do really big problems and tackle things that are extraordinarily difficult, and truthfully, the vast majority of them fail miserably. But what they do do in the process is they create bricks. They create bio bricks. They create these bio bricks that are described by what they what starts them, what stops them, how they combine together, whether they require energy, and what they, cr what they create, how they can be strung together. By creating these bio bricks in a registry and putting them in and describing their characteristics, others can be looking for a particular component, can dra grab that part, and then include it in their project. And literally all you have to do is go to the registry at igem.org in the bio bricks repository, pick the bricks you want, and they will mail you a little container that contains the biological elements that you need that you can reconstitute and use in your own do-it-yourself molecular genomics project. Sounds a little weird. And you might ask, that's great. Can students who are first-year students in biology, in fact, in some cases not even in biology from other fields altogether, do anything useful? And the answer is absolutely. And they can because they don't know what questions not to ask. In fact, they bring curiosity and enthusiasm and experience and with supervision and care uh, and mentoring by academics. These individuals, these students, can pull together, work with standard parts. Again, remember this from deconstructing the problem into simple you know, independent elements. Put together something that creates remarkable outputs. This is all based on the idea of open sharing. Science is based on the concept that you have an idea grounded in some sort of a theoretical framework, you ask a question about it, you do something in a structured way in some sort of methodological process, you get results, and the first thing you do is you give it away. You give it away to your colleagues, you give it away to other people in the world so that they can take that, replicate it by doing the whatever steps you described in your, in your process, and verify that it works for them or discover something different. 
In fact, in the early stages of computing, back before many computers, they were making these little t uh, small transistor to transistor logic circuits. They were usually done by individual companies for specific projects. But it wasn't until they started describing them and putting them together in a registry, sending that registry around freely in the TTL data book, that other people could look at those things and start combining them in ways that the individual manufacturers never thought to. And the result of that was the mini computer industry. In fact, that's where Andy got his start because he was involved in building those kinds of breadboard parts from the TTL book, which is back then was passed around in a three ring binder and described the elements of how these different circuits might fit together. So the message of iGEM. iGEM is all about deconstructing complexity. It's all about students making a difference by asking questions given guidance, but an openness to pursue an idea that leads to directions that we don't even know the outcomes for. It allows individuals to build these biological machines and more importantly make the individual parts that other people can then use for their own. And it does it in a way that allows us to do extraordinary things. I'm going to turn it to Len to talk about the ground part for a moment. Um, I guess we want to close by, by just giving an example. A few years back, uh, a team from Edinburgh, um, they built a biological machine. And these were students, remember, and some of them were, were very early on in their science careers, not, not any experience, not in any sort of biological field, some of them, and things like that. And so they were interested in building an arsenic detector for groundwater contamination. And they constructed a machine which could change color very simply, a very simple idea that it can change color and that you can look at the color change and know that your groundwater is contaminated. If you're a farmer, you want to know if your well's contaminated so that your cattle shouldn't drink from it because of a, a poison or something like that. You don't need a complex laboratory. You don't need all this testing equipment. You don't need a refrigerator to contain test reagents and things like that. You can simply get this bacterial system in this little tube, add a little bit of the water to it and tell by the color change very simply that you have arsenic in your water and you shouldn't use it. This sort of enabled technology has a great deal of knock-on effects, especially if you consider, you know, one of our major problems these days is the purity of our water, and not so much here in Australia per se, but in many other parts of the world. And so this is very simple technology which can be applied in many great areas. And so this is the promise that we get from this field of synthetic biology. And these parts, which can be used by any people to make some, some sort of a sensor in those regards and make this sort of technology enabled, can be accessed by many other scientists around the world to be able to, to get this together to be able to operate. And so that's, that's this hand-on effect that it has on it. And that's the great beauty of synthetic biology and the promise that, that we're getting from iGEM and from this repository. And so yes, students can make a difference. And so the only limitation is your curiosity. Thank you. Thank you guys. Looking forward to what advancements happen in synthetic biology. Definitely uh, should be made available to some of the creative types. The next person who is up is Michael Donovan. Michael is founding director of Edgeware Creative Entrepreneurship. I met Michael a few years ago and I admire him incredibly. Brisbane is lucky to call him a resident. There's many of his students in the audience here tonight, today. Uh, so please welcome to the stage, Michael Donovan. Thanks for that little introduction. Um, all you need is to see. Um, seeing is fundamental the most important part of creativity and my talk today is about how I came to understand that. In 2004, I met a guy who was very, very similar to me. Um, <laughs> we physically very similar, but as time went on, we found that we were similar in all sorts of other ways. Same age, daughters the same age, our partners looked like each other. It was really uncanny, it was a bit spooky. His name's uh, Ketan Lakhani from Durban in South Africa. Um, we met through a, a Danish.
this business school called the Chaos Pilot, which is a story in itself. It turns out we both have backgrounds in the arts. We were both interested in creativity in commerce. We were both interested in business that makes a difference. Um, and uh, being with him was like seeing things through my own eyes, but it was sort of shifted 20 degrees to the left. These were very generative, very productive conversations, encounters uh, with Ket and, and, and I learned a great deal. Um, seeing is, it's this seeing thing. Uh, and these days I work with creative entrepreneurs, which is to say people who design or redesign businesses, usually their own businesses, and, and seeing is important for them too because they're interested in uh, seeing opportunities, they're interested in ideas, they, they need to be creative. Um, the sculptor, Michelangelo, um, famously claimed that he could see the form of the statue within the block um, before he picked up his tools. And the process of creativity in this sense was a process of removing what was unnecessary. It started with the whole notion of seeing. So how do we develop a seeing muscle if uh, seeing is what it's about? So this is a little experiment. I, I need you to interlace your fingers like this, fairly easy, and observe which thumb is on top. And ask yourself, why? Now we'll just interrupt this routine, interlace them the other way, so the other thumb is on top. Feels weird, doesn't it? For most people, this feels weird, it's strange. And why? Why is that? Now I want to suggest that this is a metaphor for everything, for all of the routines, for all of the habits, for all of the patterns of behaviours that emotions hang from that eventually over time we come to call ourselves, you know, where nature meets nurture like this. They, they, they come to sort of create reality for us. I mean, the reason that we did this is that's the way we learned to do it the first time we did it. And we've done it that way ever since. That's become the way that you do that. In a sense, that's become the sort of reality of that action. And consequently, if you accept the idea that it's a metaphor, then we can play with our idea of reality and playfully um, disrupt, playfully um, bend things, playfully put things together, recombine things in a different way, and thus just for a moment open up a gap in reality, which kind of demands a creative solution. Once we open up the gap, then solutions, ideas, um, problems, solve solutions, uh, solutions appear to, it, to us. That it's a creative act, and it begins with the process of seeing, or seeing differently. Uh, Ketan died two years ago of a heart attack, and I just found out this year that I have a heart condition too, and it's at this point that I really hope that Carolyn will start to actually break down. Um, but it is a little bit spooky, isn't it? I, mean, I, I hope you meet your doppelganger someday. Everybody has a doppelganger, they say. Um, but I'm finding that I don't get anxious about it. In fact, it sort of makes me smile. <laughs> Because um, I think just the value of, of this seeing, of having the privilege of having met this guy and, and having been able to shift everything 20 degrees to the left just for a minute, when it comes to sort of big questions as well as smaller ones. And so in his honour, I'd like to conclude with um, some lines from a poem called The Traveller by C.J. Bennett, the Australian um, poet. You can tell he's an Australian because of the kangaroo. As I rode homeward, full of doubt, I met a stranger riding out. A foolish man, he seemed to me, but nay, I am yourself, said he, just as you were when you rode out. So I rode 